So one of the things that I really like about the greater key is that it specifies the baths for purification can be warm because I like to, uh, I like to take very blisteringly hot showers and, uh, you know, just as much as, uh, whatever preparation you're, uh, using can cleanse, uh, miasma or spirits off of you. Taking that bath out of the freezer where you uh, stored it after pre-preparing it and pouring it over your head when it's still kind of icy is oh, no. uh, just as purifying an experience. That's the Wim Hof heart attack method. I've heard of that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Listen, when, uh, when we were traveling last year, um, I think our final Airbnb, like the day that we got into it, I went around, like I put our luggage down. For those of you who don't know the context, Key and I were traveling for a month of last year for some work stuff. And uh, Salt was bravely holding down the fortress as we were texting him our updates. And one of the things that came up was like this freaking shower in our last Airbnb. It had like the water pressure of like a thousand suns. It was mm -hmm. like, you know, just like launching his arrows to pick off everything until only one remained. And I was like, oh, you're going to love this. <laughs> and, you know, after you stripped your skin off like paints and you were nothing but like an exoskeleton, we got a message from our host who was like, hey, just so you know, uh, someone's going to be coming in at this such and such time to change what's wrong with the shower. And I'm like, what's wrong with it? It's perfect. And of course, they changed the water pressure and installed a whole new thing in it that was much less uh, intense. So our <laughs> ability to purify ourselves, uh, or at least for key, significantly decreased. It was a tragedy. Mm hmm. Don't call yourself a Gnostic if your spiritual baths aren't peeling off the skin. <laughs> True. <laughs> Freeing the soul from the body. Be not alarmed at the frightful howls which you may hear. It's finger salt and bust out the hyssop key. Oh, <laughs> Freeze yeah. it first, yeah. <laughs> Put it in ice cubes, <laughs> enchant it, bless it, run it back, you know, do the whole Key of Solomon conjuration over it, uh, and then throw it over yourself in like a nice bowl <laughs> right over the head. Let it let it fully drip down. The condensation, I imagine, of your shower actually terrifies me. Oh yeah. <laughs> It's like you could you could you know be bathing on the floor afterwards, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> conjuring like spirits. I mean the the washroom is an important place where you can find gin and all manner of other spirits, right? Mm -hmm. I just have a question right. though: is um is floor condensation really what we're going to consider richly pure? Just do the exorcism of the water over everything on the floor, and you got a pre-made floor wash, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that literal floor wash. The the AOE of blessing uh, for holy water to see <laughs> how much of the water that you're submerged in is suddenly holy. The sacred lake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the canonical titration math of like, you can put exactly this much water in another body of water, and it remains holy. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm super excited to get into spiritual hygiene and sympathetic magic, especially when I think spiritual hygiene, purity, all these other terms are so often associated with notions of like morality or goodness or worth that people get very scared uh, of the topic to even approach it because it seems like it's like, you know, especially a trauma around like certain kinds of like religious upbringings, which stress a certain kind of purity that is essentially not just like harmful to the psyche at times, but like definitely overbearing. And so I think it's it's great to talk about in the in sense of magic and engaging with spirits without it being something that is weighed in with like your own personal value or worth as a sorcerer and without it being that kind of pressure, but rather just talking about it in terms of, well, 
we'll put it this way. Salt's the one who's doing the episode. And, you know, Key and I have been talking about this all week about how excited we are for you to go into this because it's not just an episode and it's not just going to be something that is going to go into a lot of interesting topics, discussions of terminology behind these efforts, as well as understandings of different kinds of purity and what this means, uh, freedom from malefica, purity of objects and locations, the state of purity as a kind of baseline, as well as mental health hygiene and stuff like that. We're going to be going over a lot, and SALT is extremely well equipped to give it to us, right? But there's also an associated course. Yeah, the first ever course coming out of With Kind and Command, which is our parent website, you know, this is the blog the three of us have. We've been kind of sitting on this idea for a while, right, guys? Because, like, we've been thinking about how to do courses in a way that, you know, I've certainly given my fair share of courses under a different name in many places, you know, and then you guys as well. Some of you have done courses, uh, you know, quite literally as Salt and as BK. Um, mm -hmm. Salt, you've been in Astromagia. BK, you've done Salem and stuff like that. But what I'm really excited about is, in this case, having our own platform, right? And pairing it with episodes. So the idea being that you would have a free episode that everyone can listen to just like this. This, that's going to be all about the theory and all about the kind of techniques and ways to approach the subject. And then there will be a practicum course where if you're interested in this and if you just want to, you know, absolutely get into the nitty gritty, get a bunch of interesting sources, get, I think, salt cart if I'm wrong, but just like 30 plus at this point, like individual techniques that you relay in, in the course. Around 30 recipes, uh, techniques as well. But in general, I've also tried to make sure it's very accessible, right? So a lot of this is influenced by my own practice, which obviously English folk magic and the nature of folk magic is it's accessible. It's simple. It's the things that are usually near you. I mean, it's, it's not always these things, of course, you know, sometimes you've got to find a donkey's head and similar. Sister of yeah. the traveling donkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Check out our blog for that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's kind of been the goal with the course is just something that anyone can pick up and use and, it's stuff that a lot of the recipes in there, for example, are stuff you'll find in your kitchen, right? Because here's the thing. Purity is a concept that is very present in pretty much any kind of practice anywhere in the world. But it's also something that doesn't just apply to practitioners. It doesn't just apply to a certain clerical caste. It applies to all of us. And that means it's inherently a topic that is accessible, that is kind of easy to engage with. And one of the things I really wanted to emphasize here as well is not just this kind of notion of cleanliness and purity, but also how that can impact our practice, how it can improve things, how it can deepen our relationships with spirits, for example, how it can make uh, their perception of us kind of go from, hey, he's, he's all right, to, hey, this guy's pretty cool. Like, that's kind of where we want to go with this program. But this course is just kind of emphasize how this can impact your practice, not just in the sense of getting rid of stuff you don't want, you know, getting rid of miasmic influences but like how to draw the things you want in life right how to mm -hmm. kind of win over the spirits with it absolutely so this is going to be the first uh course that we put out specifically as a mantra through with can command it's called pure sympathies purity and natural magic really really excited about that it's 60 usd so if you're interested you know this everything that we're going to share in this episode is still going to be completely practical and useful but if you want to dive really deep and have a valuable list of things to do as well as quick as assault mentioned you know folk charms and not just like actual practical things but also like a, a much more grounded approach to like how to incorporate this into your daily routine you're going to have a whole interesting presentation with the visuals and all that good stuff right you know the, the usual things we expect within a cult course for something for you to download then you'll have it forever you know you won't ever expire you can have the link and uh, have the course for something for you to reference as well as be able to build onto your own knowledge resources. So in the future, the three of us might put on one-off things like this where you'll have an episode and they'll be attached with something that, you know, for 60 uh, USD, you'll be able to purchase um, on the side if you so choose. So I encourage all of you to check it out. It'll be available at withcunningandcommand.com slash courses. So please keep an eye out on the space because much more is to come, especially as we kind of use this as a way to deploy oral charms, uh, spirit taught recipes, as well as long litanies of interesting resources scrambled together from grimoires and texts that uh, will be in one place, right? So that you can actually have it all in one bundle as opposed to scattered around across various books and PDFs. And as always, you can check us out at twitter.com forward slash Frightful Howls and patreon.com forward slash The Frightful Howls. Get a bonus episode every month curated by you and just for you as our patrons. Uh, we have Salt's Fantastic Almanac uh, as well coming out every month. A monthly live occult book club, sometimes movie club, where we discuss a text or film of your choosing, show notes for every episode, and far more. 
And remember to give us a like, rating, and review on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you may be listening to us. It helps us fight the demiurge of the algorithm and get our work out there. So thank you all so much. Remember to check out our services. We're all on social media. Uh, mine is Dragon Cunning. Salt is Salt C and C. Key finally at barnowl.key. That's the B of Instagram. <laughs> and and check us there, and you can see what we offer in terms of readings, coaching, uh, magical work, spell work for hire, especially for Key. Uh, and get in touch. Send us memes. <laughs> That's always the final plug, right? Just send us memes. You guys are excellent, and uh, they all end up in my stories one day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Salt. So my love, take it away. Okay, so thank you guys for the introduction. So let's get started with the concept of purity, right? Because I think it's, as you said, a concept that is often brought up in a political setting, sometimes even met with disapproval, right? Because there's a lot of practitioners out there, as you mentioned, who kind of have a difficult relationship with the concept of purity to begin with, like... It's something that is related to orthodox religion, related to hierarchy, related to all kinds of challenging political components. And of course, we also have to keep in mind the relationship to gender and socioeconomic expectations of purity. But at the same time, it does play an important role in practice. And we want to focus on that pragmatic kind of purity, the notion of purity as a necessity in the conjurer's toolkit of skills. And it's something that when I say purity, I'm using a rather broad definition here. It's not something I want to kind of precisely lay out or get semantic about. As you're going to see in this episode, we're going to be taking quite a overarching view, not just the purity, but also the things it kind of interlinks with. For example, sympathetic magic. Now, on one hand, you do have the purely physical purity, and this is kind of putting your Sunday best on, dressed to impress, and this is in some ways a kind of etiquette. And actually more than that as well. When we talk about etiquette, it's a means of engaging with spirits and winning their respect or favour, and also as it relates to protocol. And spirits have different expectations on this, and some, some of them are going to be easier to deal with. On the other hand, you also have fairies who have unwritten rules that are terrifyingly complicated to navigate sometimes, right? And this varies region to region, even an individual spirit itself may find things appropriate and others improper um, in comparison to spirits of the artificial division we would call category or class of that spirit and the same applies to hygiene as well right some spirits have really strong physical senses and are really really easily offended others care a lot less they might ignore it in preference to you know you actually doing the work at hand right there's kind of a difference between praying versus going into a full formal ritual and that can also have a impact on all this yeah, absolutely. And I really like the way that you put it out that it's such a organic concept. It's not something like, I mean, typically you hear people say that like, well, it's kind of like cleaning yourself off, right? You know, you don't want to track muddy boots through your house. You want to like, you know, put on different clothes if you're going to bed, for example. You want to be able to like be in your best outfit if you're entertaining a very like classy guest, that kind of thing. And yeah, all that has a role to play in notions of conjuration and spirit praxis, but there's also cultural forms, right? It's a, it's a living organ of practice. It's the much as like I mean purity isn't just some matter of prayer as you mentioned right it's a it's comportment it's behavior it's attitude it's kind of like the the mindset that you take into a particular meeting point with the spirit right yeah I mean even things like your deportment right like how is that going to come across if you're slouched over whilst you're approaching a very authoritative spirit that kind of wants to see that same authority in you and your mannerisms like that's a quality he can appreciate you remind me of something that I wanted to flag real quick. I've been watching a lot of videos recently by Aretha Rouhani. He has an excellent YouTube channel where he goes into Arabic magic and working with jinn and so on. And there's a, I'll link the video in our um, show notes for the patrons. But one of the things that came up in, he was talking about like, well, remember that there's within certain kind of understandings that there's spirits essentially everywhere, especially in your house. Key, do you remember the number that he cited? I'm trying to list off the top of my head. Was it like 60 or something? Yeah, he, he gave a range. He's like, assume that there are 50 to 100 jinn around just passively existing in your house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was talking about like, what it means to have like spirits passively just existing and flowing. Like, it's not like there's nothing in your room, right? And he was saying that like, as a result, when you're preparing for a ritual, when you're verbally acknowledging that you're going to do a ritual, when you're getting dressed for one, when you're ordering the materials, you know, like spirits are paying attention. And he makes the point that like, well, maybe one of these spirits will like tattle to one of their messengers who will come to one of the kings and tell them like, hey, this person really put in the effort. Like they went above and beyond to make sure that this 
thing is going to be done. And the, and it, the comportment reveals their respect for you. So I think you should show up. Like when you when they conjure you, you should really respond or send one of your uh, familiars to respond on your behalf and, and appear as you, right? Because it shows that actually, not, not just taking their work seriously, but they're taking you seriously. Like they're not just calling you and embarrassing your, themselves, you know, but they're actively going out of their way to create an environment and to create and instill in themselves a kind of respect that will make granting their wish worthwhile. And this is in response to like the idea of like conjuring a Jin King, which I don't know, I, I found that very compelling because like that's one of the things that the three of us talk about a lot, which is like, how do you flag to spirits that you mean business and that you're not just some random schmuck, you know, but that you mm-hmm. actively like are really considering uh, their time, their effort, your own, that you want results, that you're ambitious, that you're not going to settle for less, but that you do want to make sure that it's worth their while too to respond to you. Oh, absolutely. I, I really love this example you've given actually like this is this is perfect. And that's kind of exactly it, right? Like even when we're talking about things like, you know, as we said, putting on the Sunday best, that's a reflection, you know, the physical is a reflection of the inner, you know, it's the reflection of a soul, right? And so when you have that kind of sincerity being shown in your actions, including, you know, physical actions, then there's evidently a kind of quality associated with those behaviors and that is something that spirits can really find you know as you say make someone worthwhile like the spirits can see that they recognize that they acknowledge it and that will change how they interact with us how they interface with us Mm -hmm. and it's interesting too because in the video not to harp on it too much but like i do recommend highly his channel i'll put all his links but it's redderrohani.com and he has a similar youtube channel but one of the things that he kind of highlights is that it's not like not doing certain things does not mean you're like a bad person, that you're lazy, that you're not disciplined. It depends on your abilities, right? It depends on your energy and your time and so on. But like the idea being that like spirits also sometimes like know what your limits are. They know what your general routine is. They know how much free time you actually have. Not that you're like literally being spied on 24 seven. It's not to kind of make someone think that like there's all these voyeuristic beings that are tracking their every move or care so much about what you're doing. It's more that like when you're trying to attract the attention of a particular spirit, that's high up in a hierarchy, there's many other local beings that like know that spirit and can report on you, or they might ask those beings, like, what do you think? It's kind of like when you're scrying, right? You might ask the local land spirits, like, what is this person like? You know, what is, well, what's their routine like? What do they do? Like, how often do they make offerings and that kind of thing? Because one of the things that the spirits can report back to you is saying, like, well, actually, they're, they like really have a thing going for them. Like, they make offerings pretty regularly. Like, they're very uh, in tune with their environment. They don't litter. They never like put out cigarette butts randomly into grass, that kind of thing. You know, it goes to show that like there's somebody who takes the land seriously, right? Versus someone who's just like, honestly, they have a lot of free time and they have a lot of ability to do these things and they just choose not to, you know? And it's one of those things that like can be a little intimidating to, to find out, but like we don't live in an empty world as much as we ourselves police our own behavior and each other so too are a bunch of you know beings that exist around us and live in community with us and they don't have to necessarily assume best intentions of you at all times they don't have to just think that like oh i'll forgive everything this person does because they have a good vibe you know (laughs) some spirits will like you automatically but that's you shouldn't bank on that being the case it's better to prove it right definitely yeah not to invoke the maxim that actions speak louder than words but in a lot of, you know, magic and sorcery and witchcraft in general, it doesn't matter that your intention was to do the thing, but you got sidetracked. What matters is that you actually, you know, went out on the street and made that offering or that you actually got up and lit that candle or that you made the physical token of the effort or that the gesture actually occurred. One of the things just kind of in regards to purity and comportment, it's like, you know, to directly petition an audience with a deity or a king of spirits or something like this is kind of an audacious act unto itself that, you know, we as sorcerers are engaging in constantly. So there's a certain um, element of behavior that you want to match the claim. Yeah, like how many times are, you know, the three of us like trying to get the audience of like, like a human king or a prime minister or president or something like that or the CEO of a company? Not often, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to remember that like, well, you have to take the same kind of seriousness towards spirits. It doesn't mean you have to be shy around them or, you know, not necessarily like make your demands. Like at the end of the day, like you're a conjurer, like you should tell the spirit directly what you want and not necessarily settle for a meager result, right? Then your effort should match it. And that's one of the things I appreciate about like conjurations and books of spells and grimoires and the PGM as well is just the continued emphasis on how to best be with the spirits through your own comportment, which um, I don't want to take too much away from from Salt's wonderful exposition, but it's something that I think the the three of us have learned 
like repeatedly through practice how much of a difference this actually makes. And I think all of us have stories that go into directly that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things as well is like it, it can be very contextual at times. Like, you know, as we've said, if they they're going to see that you have a lot of spare time, they're going to see that you have a lot of free time, and you're kind of just chilling, not doing anything. You're not even physically tired. Like, you you got a, you know you've had a week off work or something like that. You've had plenty of time to do it. And so, you know, going in to perform this big conjuration with last night's pasta on your chin, well, they're going to give you a bullocking for that, you know, like. <laughs> That's like, you know, you're an English cunning man. It's like, they're going to give you a bullocking. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, like, like please, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's not even the spirits asking, man. That's just me, you know. <laughs> Don't... For salt, please, guys. No past on your chin. God bless. God bless. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, you know, if you're praying to angels in a kind of emergency situation and you know, you're sweaty from running or you've got a puffy face, you know, they're, they're not going to be bothered that you know you're panting and a bit distressed necessarily. I mean, some are probably going to cast judgment because some of them their job is to judge people, but the point kind of stands that like spirits can be flexible yes but the sincerity and not just you know having good intentions but knowing your capabilities and understanding those as well is really key to all of this and making sure that things do go smoothly when you are in a position to make sure that they go smoothly is crucial to all this work absolutely i think there's just so many layers to which purity or notions of purity have a lot to do with behavior and etiquette, right? I think that we don't typically associate that when we talk about it, but I would imagine that, well, here's a here's a very like base example perhaps, but like when you have friends that, you know, you're really close with and you want to introduce them to your parents, you know, how do they behave to your parents is a cultural thing, right? Or do they call them Mr. Last Name? You know, do they call them by their first name? Do they take the shoes off when they come in? Do they keep the shoes on? Like, do they put on slippers? Do they go barefoot? All of these things and like, you know, how like, familiar you are versus how distant you are. All these, you may not think of it as purity, it's more like etiquette, but for spirits, all these things are one and the same, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, for a spirit, how much distinction is there between the bodily and the spiritual body when the body is ultimately kind of a consequence of the spiritual, right? And so in the same respect, like etiquette, bodily cleanliness, like these things are very much tied together. It's kind of a very holistic understanding at play. And that can extend even to things like clothing, right? Like wearing ritually consecrated clothing versus street clothes can make a big difference. That's not to say that you have to use ritual clothing. Even in the early modern period, right, with the popularization and dissemination of medieval magic amongst less wealthy and less Catholic practitioners, we still see movement away from clerical stoles and the like. Like People were obviously doing certain things in their just regular daily life clothing. And for that matter as well, not all ritual clothing needs to be socially unacceptable. You know, you don't have to walk around in white robes or what have you, as long as they meet the needs of the spirit being called upon or the work you're doing. I don't know about you, but I do really like walking down the street in my, uh, you know, my Tao robe of art, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you don't even have a tower of art. You have like um the beautiful, what are they even called? Like the, the big pants, the name's escaping me. <laughs> oh, the, the fisherman's pants. pants? The harem pants, yeah, yeah, for, <laughs> for your harem. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, no, it's gorgeous, and it's just, but I've seen you strut in that, like, when you're all, it's like, I need to get cold brew of art to continue your book of the night hours. <laughs> and also, like, you know, purity with clothing is a whole other thing. I mean, why wear white clothing, especially in Afro-diasporic traditions, has a lot to do with, like, one, yes, white is the goth color of Africa, as so mm -hmm. it is, it is the color of the dead, but it also is a cooling color, you know, and it's one of those things that, like, it flags a, a certain level of I mean, there's there's a whole a color theory of what exactly the uh, our red colors or vibrant colors, what are dark colors or black colors, and what are white colors or light colors, uh, and the whole number of colors that you in English may not associate with these kinds of um, terms actually fall under these three. And I think that without getting too into it, one thing that's really important to note is like you do want to have a presence of purity and calm. Like you, you do want to have a presence of coolness that you're not going to be heated, right? That maybe your hair and your head are wrapped right in a certain way to prevent certain things from coming in or when it does that it comes through with light and with clarity. Whereas sometimes you might want to wear the exact opposite of that because you're a mount of a particular spirit and you want to draw them to you. So you might wear a different color that's associated with the particular spirit that you are known to be a mount for so that they could come in and have an easier 
your time moving through you, you know, without necessarily being disturbed. But truly, a spirit will take you no matter what. If they're going to come, they're going to come. So it's a matter of kind of making the, the, the vessel good for their own inhabitation, right? Because mm -hmm. purity of, of the mount of the possessed person is not just about, you know, physical comportment and stuff like that. It's also about, like, can you let go of yourself enough to let the spirit take over? Can you not let your own emotions and frustrations bleed in and then blame the behavior of the spirit onto you? Or can you ensure that the spirit behaves in a certain way as well, you know, when they're down? Not in the sense that you're like literally controlling them, but more that your relationship with them has reached a certain level of trust and comfort that they don't act out and start, you know, <laughs> angrily, you know, lambasting everyone around you because you're secretly harboring resentments and stuff like that. And quite the contrary, that they show that even when it's anger, it's their anger and not yours. And like we even see this in texts like the Picatrix, for example, that they explicitly mention wearing clothing associated with the planets and they're, you know, drawing on principles of sympathy, a la natural magic. And like you said, like even with mounting, like that's kind of part of it, right? Like the spirit, as you said, the spirit will come down, but you kind of want to make things easier on the mount, on the spirit. Like it's just better if it goes smoothly for everyone all around. And that's kind of, that's kind of one of the things I really want to emphasize in today is the relationship of purity and ritual sympathy, because it's something that is really, really valuable to us as practitioners. It can really be a game changer because our state of purity is a constant there's never a moment where you're neither pure or impure and so that means it's also going to impact our work it's going to impact pretty much everything that we do i think a really good example that illustrates this is uh, fumigations incenses perfumes these are often purification agents and they can act to cleanse rarefy and create a pleasant space for the spirits as well you know, if you make a certain incense blend, you want to make it conductive to the virtues that we're trying to traffic in. Even if that sympathy isn't necessarily what we would consider clean per regular standards. For example, if you're burning martial incense, uh, garlic or onions, pungent, acidic flavors, they're often known to keep other kinds of spirits away. But what you get are martial qualities of a certain kind that acidic and unpleasant kind of Mars. And for spirits of that nature, they'll be naturally drawn to it. There's a kind of purity for Mars, right? It's but... horrifying, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying making tear gas. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that's what they like, right? Like... I know. Listen, Key and I have been planning a bit of a like a, a law stay awake uh, episode. And the martial tear gas of art <laughs> is on the list somewhere there because, oh my goodness, I remember the first time I ever did a martial conjuration and I was really glad I had a ventilated space. Do it in like a garage with it open or do it outside, like <laughs> not in your room, please. Yeah, the, the one ingredient I really can't take, like, and I find it worse than sulfur, I find it worse than esvertida, is garlic. Garlic in an incense ruins me. I can't, man. It's It's foul. Like, and yet when just... I cook for you, you love garlic. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. It's like, <laughs> it's so different. You're right. Like you think like, of course I love garlic. Like it's going to be great. I like the smell of it. And then it's an instance and you're like, what is this? <laughs> but now you understand why uh, vampires don't like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you another fun one actually is um, water pepper, right? Mm. That one's, uh, you know, as a pepper also joined with Mars, but it's also got formic acid in, which is uh, also in ants. <laughs> and it's also edible. I'm just saying. But yeah, martial incense is disgusting. And that kind of <laughs> highlights the fact that purity is a spectrum. Like spirits have their own purity to booze, their own expectations. And what is impure to one spirit and what is really taboo can be the greatest, the greatest fucking thing on the planet for certain other spirits. What would you do if a spirit told you not to smoke for like a week? Uh, I would think about how much I care about that spirit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would also think about how much I need, what I'm asking for, if I'm asking for something. I would assume to ask me something so severe that I would be. And then I would probably think, nah. <laughs> or I'd say, if you really love me, you'd let me smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Pull the reverse Uno on the spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when they respond with, well, you're the one who's coming up to me, praying to me. I think you're the one who's... <laughs> 
I do think that's interesting, though, because uh, tobacco is so martial and so many people that I know who are magicians do smoke, but it does actually flavor your tongue and your saliva and your words with a more of a martial edge. So some to some spirits, like everything you say, if you've smoked recently, is more aggressive, uh, no matter how nicely you word it. So it is something for the, for the smokers who are not just salt to be aware of. Yeah, like, you know. Always keep a always keep a pack of Trident gum, not just for yourself, not just for your <laughs> missus, but also for the spirit. So, <laughs> oh, this episode is being sponsored by Trident. Just to <laughs> yeah, we got <laughs> we got our first sponsor, the frightful howls that aren't so frightful because you smell amazing. Just to note, we don't actually have sponsors, so uh, sponsor us actually. <laughs> <laughs> you can sponsor us over on Patreon.com forward slash The Frightful Howls, man. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I I do think that um it's a it's a really important point, right? You, it's a sacrifice, right? Like you yeah. you don't have to comply with everything, but the things that you do, you should commit to. Or even if they're necessarily ephemeral, depending on your relationship to that spirit or how often you're communicating with them. But if you're gonna go all out for one conjuration, other spirits may be like, well, why are, aren't they going all out for me? You know. Mm-hmm. We even touched on that in our. Uh episode on offerings Mm -hmm. where it's like if you're giving really extravagant feasts constantly other spirits might start to expect or ask for the same yeah like where's my where's my feast Mm -hmm. (laughs) i saw you and what you did on you know saint nicholas feast day where's my feast day (laughs) but it's also interesting because we've mentioned this a few times in in the show but like in our lives as people who are you know deeply intertwined with each other uh, we have to be aware of each other's purity taboos. Like if there's blood around, not being around certain shrines, you know, if mm-hmm. there's, uh, you know, because blood can be something that we mentioned this in the offerings episode as well. But like if some spirits sense that they get frenzied, others are disgusted, you know, <laughs> and some, you know, want more and so on. So it's really important to be aware of like, just because you're doing something that perfectly lines up with one tradition doesn't mean it carries over. And so, especially if you live with magicians, if you're dating a magician as Salt and I are with each other, you know, it's really good to remember that how your courts line up is a really important thing to divine on beforehand and see what the needs are so that each, even if it means like sequestering some shrines away from each other in different rooms. But uh, I think Salt and I are constantly, you know, doing our little showers (laughs) to make sure that (laughs) things line up well with each other, right? Yeah, it's always a matter of, you know, just checking in with them, keeping an eye out, like, and knowing their preferences, knowing, you know, the protocols that they have and what they want from us and, you know, working together to kind of understand our own and each other's courts in that sense. Like, I think uh, this worked out pretty well. Mm-hmm, absolutely. But, yeah, I think uh, I think a good example is, you know, body parts blood as you said like even down to um like woolen clothing for example that's something that some spirits can be sensitive to like some spirits really do find any kind of animal product impure like Mm -hmm. and not necessarily on an ethical basis even but just on the sense of like no i don't like it Mm -hmm. and we can even think about uh location right like mars has old battlefields jupiter with his churches uh, mercury and the moon with the roads and the sea I mean, are you going to pray to a vegetarian saint like St. David from an abattoir, right? Probably mm-hmm. not, unless you're a radical vegetarian getting ready to crush big meat. <laughs> <laughs> big meat. Listen, uh, well, that's so interesting, too, because, I, you know, I, I'm a vegetarian for spiritual reasons. Not necessarily just because porphyry has one of the most banging ever treatises on vegetarianism, but actually for a pact. You know, I don't eat meat that I don't myself slaughter. And I do slaughter animals for several of my traditions. So it's one of those things that like those I can eat, but others I can't. And that's only depending on if the spirit wants to share it with me, right? So if I were to hunt, right, hard to go fishing with you guys, that'd be one thing. If I were to catch the fish myself, but it wouldn't count if you guys caught the fish. But yeah, it's just something to keep in mind, different spirits at different fasts that they'll have you engage in. Speaking of which, this is our Easter episode. I Sorry, I'm Orthodox, so like the calendars are still... I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it, like, it's obviously, I know, it's just like some of my spirits are like, this is Easter, and some of them are going to be like, huh? Huh? It's actually in May, and it's a month apart this time around, which is crazy. So I'm going to be stuck in Lent for a while. But as a result, my Lent fast continues, right? Mm-hmm. And that's one of those things to keep in mind. Is it's can be temporal. It can be calendrical. It can be a matter of when you're taking up a certain burden and when you're going to put it down. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that really highlights the diversity in play, right? Like, and just how uh, mutable the concept of purity and even ritual timing can be sometimes. It's not to say, like, we want to be sloppy or imprecise of it, just, like, expectations really do widely vary across the board. Like, even for certain, you know, necromantic or uh, Saturnian procedures, like the ritual purity, as it were, being that which brings you in line with the kind of energy of the spirit, you might be smearing ash on yourself and like going into some pretty like, you know, what would be considered by most other spirits impure or unclean places. Like I'm all for, you know, rubbing down an ash and sitting atop a trash heap and being like, all right, let's see who shows up. Yeah, absolutely. So for necromantic practices are not just about cleaning off before and after you go to a cemetery, but also knowing what handling human remains, handling animal remains, mm -hmm. handling certain kinds of herbs that have particular properties are like. And also, that's why baths aren't just purifying in the sense that they clean you off. They also imbue you with properties, right? So like taking a Venusian bath before you go on a date with a lover imbues you with certain properties, right? Same thing as wearing a perfume. So in that way, you might want to do that before meeting a certain spirit from their retinue. And on that point, you know, with regards to certain remains or certain herbs that can flavor things, um, purity of the materia you keep, not just uh, yourself. It's also a, a huge thing, you know, labeling your stuff doesn't need to be in or out of light, doesn't need to be shrouded, doesn't need to be, you know, only messed within a certain hour. Is it kept away from other things? You know, these all all play into these concerns. Yeah, I mean, even like, you know, kind of be out in the rain versus does it have to be kept indoors? Does it have to be kept outdoors? We often think of rain as cleansing, but like to some spirits, like rain is, you know, the dead coming back to us and it can actively harm them to be exposed mm -hmm. to rain, right? Like you never want to keep a, an supplemental in rain, for example, right? So it's one of those things that I think is excellent to keep in mind that like know and research the taboos of the spirits that you're working with and consult with somebody who is either a really good diviner that can look at it from an external perspective or who's a priest in your tradition yeah exactly i mean even you know on a topic of rain like even the air right like this was really instrumental in gleaning medicine particularly like your doctor if you were wealthy and you know if you're seeing a doctor you probably are in at least the middle or upper bracket then he might have recommended you back in the day that you live near a lake, for example, if you suffer a deficiency of moisture. And mm -hmm. spirits have their own things for things that we might not really think about, like humidity, dryness, and they're not necessarily going to be insanely picky, but it's interesting how these differences play out if you live in a desert versus an arboreal climate or, you know, a little hint, somewhere exposed to the east wind but prone to blocking the west wind, then you call your spirits in that place and see how it impacts them, if it changes things. So something to be observant of, I mean, that's half the work, right? It's just being observant, paying attention. Totally, yeah. I mean, it's also interesting when sometimes, like, for lack of a better term, mess can be sacred. You know, like, we mentioned this in the Offerings episode, right? But some spirits are completely not just fine with you disposing things in the trash, but, like, there are spirits that patron the trash and patron the the waste canals and so on that do get fed. They get fed alcohol that gets poured directly down the drain of your sink. Uh, sometimes, like literally, the trash can itself gets a shot of something that goes next to it to feed those spirits and so on. And it's not to say that you need to be unclean, and not to say that like you need to be in a position in which you're exposing yourself to uncleanliness. Although some spirits absolutely will make you do that, will make you lie in graves, will make you you know be covered in cremation ash and so on. And there are certain traditions that really understand how to go through that when, especially in terms of like non-dual thinking and not just respecting, but acknowledging the inherent emptiness of form, but also the sustenance of the unity of the reality, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also spirits that actively patron these kinds of things and play into ways of kind of shattering non-dual thinking through making you engage in things that are typically considered impure. And what is considered impure is cultural too, right? In some cultures, like sharing food off the same plate as somebody else, it's not your family member, is considered insanely impure, right? Whereas like, I think the three of us do that pretty much all the time. So it also depends on how you're raised and what the ancestors of your traditions expect from you. So it's without going into too much of like a it's dependent, right? It's really about like knowing what your teacher is and what your lineage says and understanding that these are not just arbitrary decisions. These are also coded with the folklore of how to interact with certain kinds of spirits and what mistakes are made in finding them. And just like 
exactly as you mentioned earlier, you know, going to teachers, learning that lore, or in the absence of lore, asking them to divine for you or with you to determine what that may be, or even just engaging yourself in dialogue and in communion with those spirits can help you suss out what they want and don't want. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think this is kind of one of those things where the individualistic nature of contemporary practice has kind of been a barrier. But even if, you know, you don't have an active teacher, I'm sure people have peers, they have fellow practitioners that they trust, right? And in that situation, like, you also have people you can talk to, who you can work shop things with, like, you can cooperate with other practitioners that you do trust to kind of investigate these things where you are uncertain where you're unsure and i think that's really really important especially when it comes to the subject of purity where like you know you do risk offending spirits you have a lot to gain you have a lot to lose right with this kind of thing you only have one chance to make a first impression and that can impact the entire relationship going forward Absolutely right. It's not just like the spirits that are reporting back to that individual that you're conjuring. It's also that individual themselves. And, you know, you got them to the door, but how are you going to keep them there? Exactly. Exactly. Because, you know, like we were saying, right, when we think of purity, we quite often think of the uh, immediately bodily purity. But as we were saying a moment ago, like, we don't just have a body, we have a soul. And even to the medieval mind through concepts like holomorphism, there's a kind of union of body and soul together or dependence of the body upon the soul to be more precise, especially in you know more platonic Renaissance humanist influence thought. And usually we have a relationship with the soul is in charge. This isn't a relationship of equals per se. So the soul is kind of the essential. And when we're engaging with spirits, that's quite often where they're looking first, right? It's kind of, and you know, we're not going to characterize this in a sense of like, you know, shame and so on like that. It's just more about behavior and action and, what they kind of expect from us like their independent expectations and how we relate to that how we engage with that as practitioners like you know we're in a community of people we're also in a community of spirits right and as participants in that community we want to understand the ways of engaging within that community mm -hmm. beautifully said so how do you kind of conceptualize purity in action you know ritual purity in terms of like deeds ritual purity in action is how i think is meant to do two things really right is to make the exterior suitable to the spirit so it might be more sympathetic to them or the work that we're doing at the most basic level but also it's kind of to show that inward purity of the soul of the spirit to show it is in sympathy not just bodily with the spirits but in terms of the soul in terms of our you know innermost selves like who we are and we might do this by confessionals, forgiveness of sins being crucial to any Christian conjure. For example, uh, you might use spiritual disciplines like regular prayers, offerings, observances of feasts. Uh, offering to a spirit every day for the rest of your life isn't just going to impact your relationship with that spirit or things it will do for you in some kind of bartering manner. It reflects it in a devotion, right? A quality about you. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like the, it's kind of the other side of the whole feast thing. Like, yes, other spirits will be like, where is that for me? But they also will be like, hey, this person keeps a promise, stays on task, follows through, uh, shows devotion, respects the reciprocal nature of magic. Like, I, I feel like it's kind of like having a good letter from uh, another boss, right? You know, when you're like a reference when you're applying to something. It's like, oh, this person comes about. Like I can I can see that they are somebody who I can trust to keep their end of the bargain if I were to work with them. It's accruing a kind of merit, right? That shows that you're somebody that other spirits can feel comfortable working with. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and meritorious service is kind of one of the key points to a lot of practices, even from a kind of more religious sense, but even as far as like, you know, the conjurer, the sorcerer, like you merits are shows it you earn your stripes, you know? And as a result of that, I think the way that that can impact spirit relationships is can't be understated. Like, and that doesn't mean you can't fuck up. I don't know any practitioners who've never fucked up. You've never, you know, missed one offering day for, you know, a general offering or something like that. But, at the end of the day, it's kind of how often did they do that and did they do it again? But yeah, impurity can come into the mix as well, right? Like what if we aren't doing the thing that we promised to do? They're going to see that as well. They might tolerate it, they might not. But that also reflects the inward state as much as it does the spirit relationship. 
and that's key it's crucial it's kind of a that is a kind of purity you have a contract you have a taboo and these need to be followed and expectations of a spiritual social kind rather than physical but if you fail that could taint you in the eyes of spirits it could be a kind of uncleanliness that you then need to rectify and purify as an extension of like the purity of the mouth is purity of speech where it's like did you make a promise and did you keep it or are you approaching spirits after you just lied to someone because that will also flavor the speech you know did you say a sweet thing to someone in the approach of spirit not a right action and right speech post but it's kind of a technical point on extending from the offering episode well i think that's very relevant though right like mm-hmm. you know you can't be i don't think it's really an ethical judgment as much as if you're using an oral charm for example and you what you want you want what you're saying to come true then you need to speak truthfully like i think that's kind of implicit that's how sympathy works it's how antipathy works like if you're lying is that possesses a lot of antipathy towards you know getting things done by speech by talking but yeah i think as you guys can see at the end of the day when we talking about purity whilst we might try and divide it into arbitrary distinctions of physical and spiritual really they're all kind of joined together what we're dealing is the spiritual and how it can impact our spirit relationships how it impacts their perceptions of us and even how well we connect or move certain occult virtues as key just mentioned regarding truthfulness for example and I, you know this extends even to your mood if you conjure a very happy joyous spirit for the first time and you're grimacing and grumbling and i love grumbling i do but odds are the spirit's going to respond with who's this grumpy fucker go away you're annoying me you're too much black bile <laughs> yeah i mean like your past actions your current actions your disposition your condition all of that's going to impact this concept of purity this concept of etiquette I think that's why it's regularly good to work on these things, to do work that kind of cleans up after your own messes if you made them, even the ones, no, more so specifically the ones that you don't know about. And the class will talk a little bit about that, actually, because that's something I think is really important. I think it's something that's missing from a lot of people's practice is like, you know, how do you you repair something you fucked up you don't even know you fucked up, right? If you're too busy with life, if you're really got your head down you're grinding away you're not necessarily going to be in the most receptive of states to realize these kind of things right so that's something i kind of want to present as well is kind of how to repair moments of impurity yeah absolutely i think it's gonna be so helpful for people who take your class just to kind of really get into okay so i screwed up you know so or i accidentally screwed up like it was completely not intentional and it was just like i just didn't even know this was potentially offensive to a spirit it's one of the things that i think uh is kind of a problem with people who cherry pick like spirits they want to work with based on what they think is kind of aesthetically pleasing without really diving into the cultural context but let's say something by accident happened like you didn't even know how do you free yourself from that how do you make it right Last episode, we talked about ways to do it with offerings, but it's definitely, I think, a, a course module is going to be what we need to really get into the nitty gritty of like, here's actual things to do, right? Yeah, I mean, like, when it comes to kind of getting to grips with practical stuff, like, it's always helpful to have the exact method laid out and everything and learn the principles at play. I think one area as well that we haven't actually touched on yet, which is kind of surprising. Is purity as it relates to malefica and like harmful magic, malign spirits, and similarly intrusive influences, because it can be a very strong source of protection for that kind of thing. As much as purity can aid us when we're seeking helpful spirits or influences, you know, as we were saying, like we want to kind of do the things that are going to be pleasant to them. We want to kind of make ourselves amenable to them. We can also kind of aim our purity to be a freedom from harmful influences that utilizes the principle of antipathy i.e heat and cold are opposites and therefore they have antipathy towards each other so by keeping ourselves clean both literally and spiritually speaking because these are the same things we protect ourselves from the kind of impure or unclean spirits who generally don't have the best intentions or our well-being in their mind a good example that we might think about is like you know taking a bath or purifying ourselves after we call on spirits that are known to be miasmic or less clean. And we can also do this prior to limiting how tainted we end up after the work as well. 
and that does happen i think probably the most miasmic spirit i've ever conjured was um tanta valerian he's in a number of texts he's a deputy of lucifer or an intermediary a stand-in for him conjured him alongside you know Valzebuff satan or rather emissaries of those two spirits and had them swear oaths bound them up but let me tell you guys that was unpleasant i did a lot to cleanse myself beforehand i fasted i bathed i fumigated and i did all of that afterwards as well and to this day the place where that work took place is just it is unclean mm -hmm. like be wary of that kind of thing like be wary of the spirits that we're engaging with because some of them are poisonous you know never like nature itself is poison even to interact with them let alone to be in the same place with them yeah i mean and we find that in you know we find that in nature we find that in the vegetable kingdom in the animal kingdom of course we're going to find spirits who are like that themselves his very nature is caustic right and I think that's something we are quite often forget when encountering these kind of spirits. Like when we talk about uncleanliness, it's not just a moral precept. It's not just a moral judgment on them. It is quite literally like poison, venom, not good for human beings. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's so true. And there's so many spirits that even in every tradition, you'll note that like it's uh, inherently almost like a self-harm to work with them. It doesn't mean that it's impossible that one shouldn't. It's just to be aware that it will take something from you too, no matter how much you cleanse afterwards. So be aware of that and and know what your protections are and get get like help from your spirits. Like know what they advise in the situation, how they can help buffer you, and what you can do ahead of time to ensure that you know you remain unscathed as much as possible. Yeah, exactly. It's something you can strategize around. It's something you can prepare for. And the more you strategize, the more you prepare for that kind of thing, the better place you're gonna be when it happens like and you know i'm sure every practitioner is going to encounter spirits like that like willingly or unwillingly so i think it's kind of one of those things where you do want to have a plan in place so to speak mm -hmm, totally kind of reminds me of like if we look at the lesser key some of the demons are specified to emanate a miasma or worse yet actively attempt to harm you at their conjuration with their breath so you know have the seal arranged in a certain way or have the ring held in front of your face to deflect it. Protocols that make working with these things as straightforward as possible should you choose to do so. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good example, actually. And, you know, I completely slipped my mind that particular, like those particular extracts where I do mention, like the noxious breath and the miasma. And I think that's, that's spot on, like especially when you're conjuring a lot of them and a lot of them have that nature, like there's a kind of quantity involved as well, right? Like how, how present are they? How many of them are there? Like all of these can be factors as well. When you're doing grimoire work, for example, when you're conjuring, I don't know, let's say 30 different spirits at once, like and you're naming those 30 spirits. These are just the upper leadership. They're also going to be bringing their armies, their soldiers with them. Like, Ooh, shit, mm. shit can be nasty. <laughs> <laughs> The like, yikes! <laughs> the man's ain't no good. Like <laughs> it's like there's already enough sulfur and garlic burning around here. I don't need any more of this. Yeah, no, real talk, real talk. Like you know, you know, you're not supposed to take a half of the sulfur. It's bad for you, very bad for you. But sometimes it's cleaner than what the spirits are pulling out. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. I mean, it's also why they're like known to show up with smells, right? I think we've mentioned a few times that like spirits seem to have a, in many traditions, a stronger sense of smell than they do necessarily sight. But that's also, I find that like they typically manifest with very intense smells in the room or like sudden, sudden changes in the ways in which like you see lights, you see shadows, you get intense pressure in the head, you get like time warps and stuff like that in terms of like, well, if you ever have a clock in the room where you're conjuring, you'll notice things get really weird. Uh, but smells are a huge one, and one that's been pretty consistent for me as well. Yeah, scent is scent is always a player, I think, as well. Like the subtlety of scent, like there's just a spiritual quality to it that some of our other senses, like touch, for example, don't necessarily have as vividly. I think as well, like when we think about these, the spirits in their presence, like that also brings into mind like objects and location, right? Like locale and how 
conjuration can change the purity of a place how the presence of spirits can change the purity of a place even the material that you're keeping around like i think he kind of mentioned it earlier to a degree when he was talking about like is the material covered up from the sun but we also want to think about how that material is influencing the area around it for example you know some things can extend to entire regions like holy sites for example Maybe everything around it grows amazingly, even during times where the harvest isn't so great. And then you have curses that are explicitly meant to impact locales, right? Like, hey, this guy's crops are going to wither and nothing's ever going to grow here again. Or, you know, maybe some guy put a tree in the wrong corner, you know, like that's the corner of the devil in the barnyard. Like, you don't put stuff there. Well, now the entire field's gone. And whose fault is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. The area of effect, you know, remains afterwards. And you can do offerings to the, the various land spirits before and after to try and smooth some things over. But it's also important to know, like, what is the mark we leave behind? I think in the Gathering Materia episode, um, that was number 14, Key and I went in some depth about the idea of, like, what does it actually mean to not just be taking but to be giving back right and that also includes your ritual spaces right so it's not just like all you do is take and you take right <laughs> you're also like <laughs> actively contributing back to the understandings of the kind of ecosystem and the biome in which you are yeah i mean it's really key i mean i think a good example right if you're conjuring armies of spirits that aren't necessarily the most well behaved that like what do armies do historically when they're encamped in an area for a long period of time right nothing good to the local population especially you know when you have very wild very i guess rambunctious spirits who are causing chaos everywhere one at a time as it is and now you've got a whole bunch of them you, you might want to you might have some explaining to do to the local <laughs> to the local magistrate of spirits or what have you <laughs> mm -hmm. you know if you're going to be conjuring one of these spirits who carries with them an unruly nature or a miasma all to their own, you know, informing beforehand your house spirit or the spirit of the land that you're on doing the conjuration be like, hey, I'm about to fuck up this area for a little bit. How do I remedy that after the fact? Or can you help me mitigate the damage? You know, in previous episodes, we've mentioned the Kronos Oracle that you perform, Svenga. You know, it's like, what do you do about the salt that is spread on the land? And how to kind of mitigate those effects yeah i think that's a really really crucial point there as well like the impact that we have whether for you know better or for worse and how we can kind of you know restore things to a proper balance once we're done like if we you know if we're bestowing a blessing on a certain place and that particular the method we used is taking up resources for example we're also going to want to kind of deal with that later down the line we don't want our spirits to work over time when you know we've consecrated or you know blessed the household but they don't live there anymore right like we don't want yeah. our spirits to be working off over there either mm -hmm. yeah and with the oracle of chronos and then i just didn't want to piss off the land spirits that i have been working with regularly so let them know ahead of time that I still needed to have the compulsory effect it's going to have for the ritual, but I also want to make sure we're still chill. <laughs> sometimes you do have to just kind of trespass, you know, sometimes you do have to do something that is not going to earn the approval of everyone, right? Because we need to still be bold. We need to still kind of get our bag, as it were. You know, sometimes it's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, be at this grave and be doing this thing you know and you know so be it you know you're at the end of the day you're the conjurer right but i also think that it's not necessary to have the most aggressive approach with everything especially when it can be helped otherwise just so that you're still in good compartment with the spirits and not seen as someone is always bulldozing over them exactly right it kind of ties into purity as etiquette there like you know be assertive don't be a dick <laughs> mm-hmm so, Salt, I'm curious, what what are your takes on, you know, purity with regards to defending oneself from Malefica as well as the use of Malefica? So I think in the latter case, right, in the case of using it for Malefica, the nature of Miasma, as we've touched on, making someone's shrine so offensive that spirits don't want to spend time there, getting them in trouble with local spirits and disrupting their relationships with them. Uh, I mean, you know, being impure can make you ill it can make you physically sick as well so 
you know, it might be as simple as placing a malaise over the target or it can kill plants and crops via miasma in the air. Or, you know, there's also the the flip side of that, right? Like some making someone sick so that they are miasmic, so that they can't be calling to their protective spirits as easily because they're not ritually pure. They can't necessarily go into the shrine room, which is kind of the fortress, right? Like that's usually where people have a lot of their stuff concentrated as far as protective stuff because that's the most sensitive area for a lot of practitioners and i think as well in the case of you know freeing oneself from it like maintaining regular disciplines maintaining your alliances with amicable spirits and maintaining a good regimen of purity so for example you know, we can talk about basic character and virtue with temperate conduct and sincerity and, you know, qualities that your spirits want from you, not religious grandstanding or moral grandstanding here, but like specifically, what do your spirits want from you to help you be better as far as what you can attain? What would make you happy? What's going to make you flourish, right? In a way that's true to yourself. That sounds kind of fluffy, but ultimately at the end of the day, that's what they want for us. And I think as well, we can forsake vices that are going to lead us to potential downfalls or potential injuries. Uh, we can think about ritual fasting, right, as something that can produce good purity, good virtue, because we're abstaining from the more fallible qualities that we possess. And that means in the case of Malefica, for example, there's less for it to exploit, there's less for it to kind of hit, right? If you're actively abstaining from alcohol, right, or cutting down your intake as a kind of ritual fast, someone cursing you is going to have a harder time, for example, hitting your liver, potentially. And as well, we can think about, like, you know, consistent prayer, religious activity, that clarifies it brings us closer to them via the virtue of piety and devotion. And that in itself is kind of purifying for the soul, right? Like, I don't think anyone's going to disagree that prayer is a very purifying action. It's something that exalts the spirit. It's something that exalts every part of ourselves. It brings us closer to the object of our worship. And of course, we have more physical ritual actions like ritual bathing, cleansing, washing, scraping, immersion and purificationary liquids on a semi-regular basis or scraping the body with certain herbs. And this doesn't need to be too complicated. Like it can be, you know, you can have nine, 12, 24 herbs in a packet. You can have one like you can have one in Psalm 51, or you can make these really ornate procedures. Like it kind of just depends on what you're trying to do, the kind of use case and, you know, what the spirits want in that moment, if they're helping in this work, not everything is necessarily done with active spirit participation. Sometimes it's more passive, you know, the concept of natural magic is quite closely related to that. But in general, like this is kind of, the trouble with talking about concepts like purity is such a general subject is that we can't give two specific examples because there's tradition dependent, spirit and context dependent. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's also an important point to be made of like, well, if you're calling a certain spirit to attack somebody, for example, and that spirit brings a certain kind of defect with it, then make sure that doesn't transfer on to you by virtue of using it, right? There's a reason we don't give our true names to spirits, especially ones that we contract for these kinds of things. There's a reason that one sets up decoys for protection, right? So that things kind of don't necessarily splash on you, but get dispersed. Always a big fan of decoys and the, for lack of a better term, you know, that kind of eggshell method of Matryoshka dolls. And also just making sure that like you protect yourself from the influences of what you're summoning through having a much better relationship with your own court, right? So that if you're subcontracting somebody for something that you know kind of like what their take is on that and how they're, what they're going to let through, what they're not going to let through when you uh, conjure. Yeah, exactly. I think this is kind of one of the important points, right? Is like sometimes your spirits will set boundaries with other spirits that you don't even know need to be put into place. Like these relationships are really pivotal to every kind of work we do especially when we're engaging with tricky, more wild spirits. Mm -hmm, absolutely. I think as well, like, we can also think about the purity of the physical space around us, right? Like dusty shrines and altars or, you know, stuff all over the floor in front of a shrine isn't isn't ideal. Like the spirits are walking on that floor, right? They're, they're walking on that floor to get there. 
So you want to keep those things clean. You want to address those quite quickly. And you, know, you can do that by sweeping, for example, or by washing with herbs. And there's also being consecrated or ordained by the spirits, you know, having licenses or packs with certain spirits that can also help the purification process. Initiations can grant certain qualities, for example, certain offices. And those offices themselves have kind of, I guess, what you might term as like, a freedom to engage in certain actions or in exchange for more taboos or similar. Like there's kind of a contract there that enables and also prevents from engaging in certain actions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's also, you know, keeping one's word and contracts with the spirits and just maintaining that. And, you know, the daily actions that are suitable to what we do every day, uh, deceit and impropriety and making avoiding deceit or impropriety and making sure we do our offerings regularly and you know in general i think one of the key points is keeping awareness of the spirits we're engaging with the preferences and protocols and as well you want to use proper and relevant materials like the ones that are inoffensive you don't bust out sulfur incense when you're calling the angel Raphael to ask him questions about the cosmos and of course you know bones dead things animals all of that needs to be confirmed prior no spirits are these things, no spirits get on with these things. And that's important to consider. That's important to keep in mind. And of course, you know, your own mind state, what are you bringing to the table? What are you bringing to the spirits? What are you, not just what are you speaking with, with your physical voice? What's in your heart when you're engaging with them? Yeah, absolutely. It's such a great point, especially with regards to like, it you know we've talked about spirits like noticing what your habits are but it's the same thing with everything it's not just about segregating sacred and profane like all things if you're an animist to have spirit in them so even the way in which you clean your house even the way in which you show respect to your partner the way in which you know you pick up after yourself and don't necessarily just like leave that burden other people around you you know all this comes into play with how you interact with spirits and i think that's it's also something that i really wanted to emphasize as well um just for a second is like i think there's a kind of mental hygiene too that like it's okay if we're insecure it's okay if we have anxiety it's completely normal to have things that make certain kinds of disciplines difficult we mentioned that in our offerings episode right like don't don't overpromise, you know, but like find the rhythm that works for you without necessarily assuming that you have to meet some kind of strict regimen to be seen as somebody who is, you know, reciprocal to the spirits. Like you, you will find your own rhythm, you know, and you will work it out in a good priest and a good in a tradition in which you are learning, especially if they are well trained with dealing with all kinds of neurodivergence will be somebody who can actively help you with this. Right. So these are just prescriptions that are kind of generalized. So it doesn't mean it's fit for every specific instance, but something that I think has to do with like mental hygiene, for, for um, approaching spirits is also not necessarily constantly telling yourself it's not going to work, the ritual will fail, the spirit won't show up, right? There's so many times that like having that attitude can be sensed and can be picked up, right? I, one of my spirits even told me that like sometimes like really negative thoughts that I'm having can be smelled, like literally like it produces a scent for them that they can pick up and then that can alienate some things and that can also you know, push away the result that you're hoping to have because the, for lack of a better term, the power that's flowing out of you is not finding its terminus point. It's just being recycled back inwards, right? It's a, it's a kind of obsession with the self. It's like in the Incantation Bulls episode, right? Number nine, where we talked about how these things can kind of like spiral inwards. And one of the problems with that is like, now you're in the situation in which you just can't help but feel like the you're trapped in a prison of your own bad habits right so like find the things that let you have hope and remember that hope and joy are some of the most purifying things you could possibly engage in exactly i think that's a beautiful point actually remarkable how sometimes like i think key and i were talking about this the other day but salt you know i've also really observed this is that having like a really really bad attitude towards a certain ritual can actively this like this may the spirit from even showing up right so like it's mm -hmm. such a crucial thing it's not to say that you should be coping or thinking like it's gonna you know this thing will will uh you know worked when it didn't work and stuff like that we are all three of us are exceptionally ambitious results oriented witches and sorcerers like we are not here to cope if we asked for a certain thing to happen we need to make sure that thing actually happened like and not just kind of being like well actually on some level it did you know like no not at all and never ever ever trust anyone in magic who tells you otherwise to 
be honest. Like we've all spent money that we shouldn't have on courses where the person that are basically trying to either dissuade us from doing magic or encourage us to not to even take seriously that certain results are possible. Like, no, we've all seen miracles and that's why we're obsessed with magic. That's why we're so power hungry with respect. But it's important to have an attitude that's conducive to it. It's like the when you're when you're writing a petition and you say, like, I have this, like I've achieved this already, even when you haven't, right? Take the same mental hygiene in with your ritual so that the spirit doesn't think, like, well, why am I even showing up for someone who's clearly so pessimistic that they might even be resistant to hearing me when I talk to them and negotiate with them? Exactly. It's like if you have a close friend who is constantly in your ear going, well, I don't think you'll really be able to pull that off. Or just being like, yeah, that's impossible. It's not going to happen. How is that going to affect you? And how is that going to affect them? You know, and it's the same way with spirits. If you think they can't pull it off, they're like, well, fuck you. <laughs> you know, and they have every right to. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that like the belief is everything, but there is definitely something there. Yeah, 100%. It's not about the belief necessarily, I mm -hmm. think, per se. It's about the um, attitude that you have. It's like when uh, it's like helping a friend, right? Exactly. And uh, they're constantly bogging you down with information about how your mutual venture is not going to work out. It's one thing to be realistic and to be able to be open-minded to hear the criticism of a spirit when they tell you, hey, I'm not you know, confident in this. I don't think this is going to work out very well. It's another thing entirely to have, you know, that spirit uh, constantly or you to them constantly telling them that, like, you know, it's, it's, it's doomed from the get-go, right? Exactly. So at least at the, it's, I think it's one of the reasons why faith is a virtue, right? In religions, mm -hmm. right? It's like having faith as much as it's really, really, really helpful to have skepticism and to be careful and to not, you know, fall for spirits. They all have agendas. They're all going to have reasons to tell you what they're going to say, even the ones that you trust, because you're the same way too, right? But it's another thing to really go into it and be completely incapable of of any kind of like joy. Because at that point, like, why are you, you know, it's hard when thing, the circumstances are not so great. And so you're trying to ameliorate them with magic. But to not even have the hope that it will work can offend spirits from working uh, on your behalf too. Well, Salt, my love, what are some things that our, you know, listeners can expect in your course? Give us a little tease. Yeah, so start with, we're going to cover some of, you know, the fundamental concepts that we're going to be encountering, but we won't spend too long on that. Most of what we're going to be doing is going over some of the practical elements and also sharing some recipes, some approaches to these things. So we'll cover bodily purity and, you know, washing, fumigation of the body, the notion of prayer and confession for the spiritual health and also the repayment of spiritual debts, for example, to spirits that we might owe and rectifying and correcting errors in our own practice or errors that we've done without really being aware of that. And we'll also cover, you know, purifying space, purifying locations, purifying places, uh, sweeping, brushing, and the same for people as well, like both ourselves and other people how we can purify the household, how we can purify the people around us if we need to help them out. Maybe they're dealing with Malefica, for example. So we're also going to touch on not full-blown exorcism, but like, you know, smaller things, more more manageable things like the evil eye, for example. How can we deal with that using purity and using purification to kind of extol these less pleasant qualities or malign influences over people? And... We have a lot of different things that we're going to touch on. There's a substantial number of methods. Most of them, as I said earlier on at the start of this episode, are very easy, very accessible, very short as well. That's kind of that's kind of the idea, right? Clarity of the soul, cleanliness of the body, purity in ritual space, and freedom from suffering and malice. Beautiful. Well, I'm personally really excited to take it myself and to go through all the wonderful material you've prepared. And I'm excited for uh, just more opportunities to kind of like present these uh, specific targeted modules to people that, you know, if you liked the what we touched on in the episode, which will always be free and available to everyone then, and you want to go in a little bit deeper and get some tech, get some meat in there and actually like have a whole downloadable module full of stuff to do, as well as the references to texts, primary sources and so on, where you can find these, uh, then I think it'll be a great opportunity for everyone. So that's a reminder that's going to be at with cunningandcommand.com forward slash courses. Uh, you'll see the pure sympathies, purity and natural magic from salt as our debut looking forward to seeing you all that
Mm -hmm, wonderful. And for our Kashuk records, I have two this time. These are just what I was uh, listening to while we were talking about this. One is What Me Worry by Portugal Demand, because <laughs> why worry? Why stress? <laughs> mm -hmm. Also, I do like Portugal Demand, so this is one of those ones that's been looping in recent moments. And also Liberation by Harold Van Lepp. Just as a little teaser on what it feels like to have gone through a pretty good spiritual hygiene practice. It's uh, it's remarkable what, you know, <laughs> for me, like what getting out of bed earlier, going to, to the gym. Thank you both Key and Salt for really inspiring me to do that more <laughs> often. My gym bro loving, you know, best friend and boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, uh, you know, just kind of like actually cooking better, all that good stuff. Like I've always been pretty good about that. But like now it's remarkable the effect it's had on my meditation practice, on my ability to kind of connect with my spirits. Like it's all really, you know, the holistic body practices stuff has been really, really helpful. So I think it's always good to note that, uh, you know, your diet, your exercise, all these things contribute to uh, your ability to kind of um, not just... Uh, be more in touch with your body, but like love your body for what it is, right? Like not necessarily stress about it, not necessarily judge it based on other kinds of factors, but just remember to thank it for existing and for carrying you on your feet and for, you know, giving you strength in your arms and so on, no matter what stage of life you're at and no matter, you know, what ability range you have to thank it for being there and for allowing you to move through the world, uh, however you do, right? So those are kind of my uplifting songs of the day. My Akashic record for this episode is, um, more informed as a, uh, a pun than anything on uh, today's episode title, which is uh, 25 Bucks by Danny Brown featuring Purity Ring. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yours sometimes are very punny, and I like that. Mm -hmm. I'm like... Yeah, it doesn't have to be so related. <laughs> no, you know, sometimes it's completely random and sometimes it's like, uh, this is a it's a little on the nose. <laughs> but the sometimes, license of... Go ahead. Sometimes it's just whatever I was listening to while the episode was being put together. <laughs> Indeed. And, but you know what is always on point, and at least in this case, the license of the part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Much more thematic to uh, today's episode. Today's license to depart is the prayer to be said when entering the bath from the Key of Solomon, specifically Book 2, Chapter 5, concerning the baths and how they are to be arranged. I picked this one out just because of how that chapter starts, which is, the bath is necessary for all magical and necromantic arts. Really explicitly pinning down the need for purity in these operations. Mm -hmm, wonderful. Take it away. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> I exercise thee, O creature of water, by him who hath created thee and gathered thee together in one place, so that the dry land appeared, that thou uncover all the deceits of the enemy, and that thou cast out from thee all the impurities and uncleanliness of the spirits of the world of phantasm, so they may harm me not, through the virtue of God Almighty, who liveth and reigneth unto the ages and ages. Amen. We're not eating ants. We'll just have pepper walk for dinner, I guess. <laughs>